Psalm 107, 31 says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. And I think it would be appropriate for us to take a little bit of the time this evening and just praise the Lord a little bit. It just mention some things that God has done and give Him the praise that He deserves. And so we'll have just a minute that anyone who'd like to praise the Lord could do so. Ten seconds is gone. Angela? Well, I think you must see my Facebook memories because the last praise that you had was like, I forget, so many years since Savannah's first surgery. And yesterday was three years since her huge surgery. So. Three years. <laughs> wow. Amen. So Alex and Emily have been married four years. Four years. Been married before that. <laughs> you know, we'll just call it ten because it'll be just soon enough. And if, if I don't say ten years, I'm always short a little bit or a long a little bit. I guess I'm short a little bit. So, amen. Amen. What a miracle. Dad? I think the Lord gives me pretty good health. Yeah. As old as I am. I'm in much better shape than my boys. Yeah. <laughs> Wish we'd get more work out of you, though. <laughs> Lee. I praise the Lord that we had a lot of people show up for the bus today. Yeah, we, we had 19 or 18, 18 on the bus? 18. 18? Mm -hmm. We're right on the edge of needing the second van uh, for, for Sunday mornings. And if we had the second <coughs> van, I think we'd have a lot more folks, too. So we're getting pretty excited about that. Looking forward to that. Amen. Timothy, was your hand up? No. I just praise Lord Tashi's here. I just... <laughs> I was afraid he'd get eaten in China or something. <laughs> Good to see you back, brother. We're taking uh, just Thanksgiving praises uh, to the Lord. Share things. Brother John? I was just thinking back April 16th, 1968, I met the Lord as my Savior, and then I met this young lady here, and we've been... She married. the one that you caught her eye? What's that? Is she the one that you caught her eye? Yes, yeah, I caught her eye, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't heard that lame joke, ask Brother John and he'll be glad. <laughs> <laughs> but we said we have a wonderful Savior and yes. what the doctrine that got me saved was that we have eternal security and I, until I understood that I was trusting in myself to keep from losing my salvation. And so I'm, I'm so glad that I can't lose my salvation. I'm kept by His power. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I'm really thankful Devin's dad's doing so well. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, I mean, he's doing really well, isn't he, Devin? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just uh, when you go up there now, he's just in great spirits and... and uh, What's that? He's thankful for so many yeah, things. Oh, yeah, trakes out. Trakes out. Yeah, uh, trakes awesome. out. He's doing a lot of uh, doing a lot of therapy. Sunday's his rest day, but every other day he spent a lot of time in the therapy room doing therapy and uh, spending six hours out of bed every day and uh, just just uh, doing doing fantastic comparatively. And it helps me to be thankful just to see. You know, a person go from not being able to move your hand or your arm or anything. Mm -hmm. You're thankful for everything you can do, mm -hmm. and I just I try to focus on that. Remember, man, I'll tell you, but for the grace of God, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. Mm -hmm. None of those things. But I'm thankful for that. And uh, it's, it seems cliche, I guess, but not only am I thankful for salvation, but calling and purpose, that God's given us a reason to live and to, to be able to just live confidently and be able to know that you're in God's will and uh, is just be able to be satisfied, satisfied with the life God's given us. Just really wonderful. Anyone else? Anyone else? Tasha. Hey, my daughter and my granddaughter are is, uh, coming home tomorrow. Good. She's been asking about the church. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. I couldn't be more thankful. Yeah. So that, and then we've all been praying about it for a long time. And, uh, yeah. Isn't it amazing all the prayers God just does? I mean, just the impossible. It's amazing. It's it serious. just seems normal that God does the impossible, doesn't it? Yeah. It's just uh, joyful every time. 
Amen. Amen. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Jose? His church, how it's growing. Yeah. Yeah. Our church is growing. God's been doing great things in our ministry, and, and it's just great to be part of it, to be part of something where God's moving and working. thankful for our young people in our church. We have, I'm always biased, you know, but even from an unbiased perspective, we just have the best the best kids and teenagers. Uh, God's just really blessed us with wonderful youth and young people in our church. And you know, the old people, they'll die off and then they'll, uh, we won't have to worry about, well, I'm just great. I'm just <laughs> Somebody left our church some years ago and they said that we weren't old enough. And I just didn't know what to do about it. I said, you wait long enough, and we'll get there. You just be patient with us. We'll get old. But uh, they weren't willing to wait, so too bad. Are you in 1 Samuel chapter 16? All right. I want to look at just a simple, just one thing tonight. should take about two minutes, but it'll probably take about 30. Uh, but we'll try. We'll try and see what we can get done here. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And if you, if you would just look down at, at uh, verse 14. The Bible says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And so we'll pray. Father, I pray that you would just help us, give us good understanding and help us to really know your character as we look in this transition of the kings and the judges and now the transition from Saul to David. Help us just to see your heart, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's some nuggets here in 1 Samuel, some doctrinal nuggets. There's a lot of historical material in this book. 1 Samuel is one of the books of history in the Scripture. You know, the, the Old Testament of the Scripture is divided up. I don't know how it's divided up, but the Sunday school teachers know all that, and so you can ask them about it. Uh, but you know, you have the, the books of the law, and then you have the books of history, and you have the books of the prophets. And this would be books of history that we're in right now in the Scripture. And first, or 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable. What's it profitable for? Let's list it. You ready? Doctrine. What's doctrine? It's teaching, right? Reproof. What's reproof? Correction. Well, that's correction. Correction's correction. Reproof isn't correction. What's reproof? What's wrong? You're wrong. You're wrong. What? Calling out. Calling yeah, calling somebody out. You're wrong. Yeah, reproof. I mean, you're right, but... <laughs> <laughs> correction. Correction. This is how you get right. This is correct. That's wrong. And this is right. <coughs> By the way, reproof and correction are married, aren't they? Mm -hmm. One is no good without the other. Why change if you're not wrong? And what good is it to know you're wrong if you don't know how to change? Reproof and correction. And a mature believer who is working with people realizes the marriage of those two. Reproof, correction and instruction and righteousness. This is how to, how to be like God, how to be like Jesus. Much of the time in the books of history, we do see instruction of righteousness. Is a lot of it. Because what we see is God. In other words, man did this, and this is how God responded. Or God did this, and this is how man responded, and how God responded to man. And we saw a little bit of that, didn't we? You remember? Who was it? We saw that. Remember what God said to King Saul? What did He say? I would have... Yes, I would have established your kingdom. So you did this, and this is how I responded to what you did. And so now you're finished from being king of Israel. And then sometimes when we study the books of history, usually uh, we look at, this, at the story... We look at what the Bible directly, expressly states. <clears throat> a lot of times, we try to pull principles you know, from a story. Here's the principle behind whatever. But we don't really want... The principle isn't the main teaching. It's the overt teaching. 
So God said this, and he was pretty clear about it. And God said to Saul, he said, if you hadn't done this, I would have established your kingdom. And so we know about, about God that he's not a respecter of persons. In other words, he wasn't looking from someone from the tribe of Judah or from the tribe of Levi. Uh, God was looking for a person who had the right heart. Saul had the wrong heart. If you ever have the trouble understanding the Saul-David thing, you know, David was a lousy guy, Saul was a lousy guy, but God used David and established his kingdom. What was the difference between Saul and David? The heart. The heart. David would humble himself. Saul didn't humble himself. That was the last instant we saw, instance we saw of him grabbing Samuel's garment and rending it. And Samuel's response is, God's rent your kingdom from you. And now, the Bible says that an evil spirit from God troubled Saul. Now there's doctrine here, there's teaching here, and there are many individuals who want God to be responsible for evil. They, they need God in their theological system to be responsible for evil. And so, they... Uh, make extreme statements about God, about judgment. And who, who would those individuals be, Charlie? Calvinist. Why are you calling names? Hmm. Alright, thank you, Charlie. Calvinist. You know, my dad's name is John Calvin. No kidding. Hmm. When I was a kid, I remember somebody talking about John Calvin. I thought, my dad doesn't believe that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> He's John Calvin. His granddad's John Calvin. We're probably all Calvinists from way back, for all we know, or somebody liked him somewhere back back in the day. Uh, but yeah, Calvinists Calvinists believe, and you know they'll never agree that you understand what they believe or correctly articulate their viewpoint because they never agree with themselves you, normally. Uh, but a Calvinist would say, well, you know, God wants evil, or God chooses evil, or God is ultimately the source of evil. They'll say that. And they'll come right out and say it. I was a couple of years ago, went to what I thought was supposed to be a prayer conference. And it wasn't a prayer conference, it was a Calvinism convention. And uh, they didn't preach about prayer. The, the guy preached Calvinism. Just a whole bunch of One of the statements that he made, Lee, were you at that conference? You didn't get to go. Too bad. Yeah. Uh, Charlie, you were there. Charlie, he said something like this, didn't he? God wants evil. Didn't he say that? Something along those lines. Some along those lines. Yeah, God wants evil. God does. God's responsible for that. That's a direct quote from Charlie. God, uh, God wants evil, and God's responsible for evil. He said, and it's good. No, it's not. No, it isn't. That isn't God. Isn't who God is. A Calvinist has a skewed vantage point of who God is. The notion that God, before an individual is born, wants them to go to hell, or it's His will uh, for them to be lost forever. And that just like you know a pagan concept of fate, that that's their fate to be from the foundation of the world condemned by God. My friend, it's just a lie. So we've seen a little bit of teaching which directly contradicts that. But Calvinists do like to say in this passage of Scripture we looked at this evening that the evil spirit uh, from God, they try to say that, that God is the source of the evil in this context because it fits within their theological system to do so. And the fact is is that it's contradicted. And I just want to briefly look at that this evening and remind you about it just in case you run into it sometime so that you can be encouraged and helped by the truth. The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now when we see that preposition in our language, oftentimes in the source languages that they come from, oftentimes there is uh, what is called in the Greek language a genitive of source, or uh, it would be a preposition that uh, shows that this is where the source or the, uh, the origin of the Spirit comes from. But the fact of the matter is that that isn't the only kind of way that it can be used. And in this situation, in this case, the other possibility would be that evil spirit from the Lord means that evil spirit and uh, God allows it. In other words, it's from the Lord that an evil spirit troubles Saul. And what that means is God doesn't 
sin, that the evil spirit isn't emanating from the Lord. By the way, you will see in other contexts, capital S spirit, same word in the Hebrew, but then when we see spirit or evil spirit, it will be the same word uh, used as spirit of the Lord, but it's not capital S. And the reason is because there is a distinction between the spirit of the Lord and the spirit from the Lord. And then simply the idea here is permission. The idea is that a spirit has permission from the Lord. You'd see an instance like this if you were to study Job chapter 1 and you would see uh, the Satan coming up into the presence of God and God saying, Whence comest thou? And he said, You know, I've been going to and fro in the earth and up and down in it. And God says, Hast thou considered my servant Job? In other words, Satan was permitted to come into God's presence as well as Satan was permitted to leave God's presence out of rebellion before God. In other words, that was from the Lord. In other words, from the Lord means direction. It means going away from, going uh, against. Uh, and that would be the situation with King Saul. Now I want to just say a couple things about evil spirits because the truth of the matter is that we live in a world where the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in little small spots, no, high places. Right? So... The fact is, particularly in an atheistic culture like we are beginning to live in, in a westernized culture that rejects any concept of anything spiritual, I believe that the Satan is pleased to be silent with individuals who don't believe in him. I think he's just happy to kind of not be visible, not be effectual around people that don't believe in him because he's just... He's, he's got you right where He wants you anyway. If you don't believe in the devil, you don't believe in God. How many of you know people that came to faith in Christ because of an encounter with evil? Yeah, a lot of us. A lot of us. I'm thinking of an instance this last week where someone uh, really got their bell rung by evil and it pointed them to God. Because every time you see an encounter with the devil or with a, with a devil, small d devil, uh, you're reminded of the fact that if there's a devil, if there's good, if there's evil, there's good, and if there's good, there's evil. And sometimes the Satan messes up a little bit by tampering with people, and when he does that, it drives them to God because of evil. And God's good that way, isn't He? Uh, friend, let me just stop here and pause a second and say, never give place to the devil. Don't ever give him place. Bible says we're not supposed to, and uh, don't give him more credit than he's due. Amen. Don't give him more credit than he's due. He's a match for you, but he's no match for God. He's more than a match for you, but he's not even a match for God. I love reading Revelation when God tells an angel, tie him up. <coughs> God doesn't tie him up. God has an angel tie him up. He can't resist God's angels. He sure can't resist God. He's not so big compared with God. And so we don't give Him place that way and we don't credit God or, or we don't blaspheme God by uh, saying that God's Spirit did things which the devil's Spirit did. By the way, you ever study blaspheming the Holy Spirit? What do you think about taking a text of Scripture like this the wrong way and saying that capital S Spirit is responsible for small s Spirit, evil Spirit, uh, devil Spirit? But Saul is a case study of an individual who on a personal level, I believe, went crazy. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, look at his acts. Look at his actions. You tell me they're rational, would you please? Tell me Saul's a rational, thinking man. You know he was. He went crazy, went out of his head, went bonkers. You say, well, was it because of an evil spirit? Well, here's the deal, Christian. We need to preach this more. We need to talk about this more. A lot of what we call mental illness is people going crazy because of giving place to the devil. A lot of what we think is mental illness is individuals giving place to the devil, and that is precisely what happens in Saul's life. Saul is faced... He's faced with a decision, and it's an easy decision. 
when God said that His He would not sit on the throne forever, what did that mean? Well, it mean that Jonathan it meant Jonathan didn't get to be the next king. When God said to Saul, God has rejected you from being king and He's put another in your place, what was the decision Paul was rationally faced with? Well, who is the guy? Let's let him have the kingdom. Did Saul fight to be king? Oh, he had opposition. So David. Saul fight for the position? God had him anointed. He hid. And he still had to be king. God gave him that position. And God had taken it away. That's it. Saul's son, Jonathan, was the example of how Saul should have responded. Jonathan said, well, if David's evidently the king, I'll be his best friend. I'll be his servant. And that should have been Saul's response. Friend, it's important when you and I come to a place of chastisement or judgment, it's important that we respond the right way. And if you don't respond the right way, you'll go nuts. You'll do stupid things, irrational things, crazy things. Your behavior... Did I say stupid with my wife here? Don't tell her. <laughs> You'll do things that don't make any sense at all. you ever done something afterward? You, you just try to figure out how you can explain yourself? I mean, just like... Well, the reason I... Well, that's not going to work. Well... <laughs> <laughs> and you just have to come down and say, I just was out of sorts. I wasn't right. Amen. I wasn't right with God. And that's, so that's why I said what I did. What I said. That's why I behaved in the way that I behaved. But Saul is not going to respond that way. Saul is just going to try to hold the kingdom. Mm. He's going to try to keep it. And my <laughs> friend, as you look at Saul's life, you see him go down into a tailspin of disaster until ultimately it results in his going to a witch. And that's really his end. Just going down and down and down. I want to read some verses this evening. I just want to tell you our conclusion. Uh, chapter 16, verse 15. Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Well, that's pretty helpful. This is, the Holy Spirit's not just being repetitive for uh, just to be annoying. An evil spirit from God troubled Saul. And his servant said, An evil spirit from God troubles you. Now, they gave him a solution. And... I'm not going to say it was a terrible solution, but it didn't solve the problem. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player and in heart, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And look at verse 23. It came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took in harp and played with his hand. Saul was refreshed and was well and the evil spirit departed from him. Now friend, let's don't play games here. We're talking about a devil bothering Saul. I don't believe he was... I do not believe that Saul uh, was possessed by a devil, but he was certainly tormented by one. In the New Testament of the Scripture, we see that it's possible for a believer to undergo the same. What happens when a Christian is out of fellowship with God and won't get right, and he gets turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Satan cannot inhabit him, but he can torment him. And the devil would love to torment one of God's children. I'm not here this evening preaching demon possession for believers. That's impossible. The Holy Spirit of God does not cohabit with devils. But when you quench the Spirit of God, and when you ignore the fellowship of the family of God, and you put yourself in the position where you get turned away from God's protection, God says you can, you can have permission on that one. And that's a reality. It's a real thing. 
And it really happens. And the reason God allows it is why? Why does God allow that? Correction. <laughs> yeah. You've already been reproved and you know what correct is, so get right. I love reading 2 Corinthians after reading about the man. The man that was committing adultery with his father's wife. I love reading the restoration statement in 2 Corinthians. Forgive him. Lest he be overcome with overmuch sorrow. Sorrow worketh repentance. A godly sorrow worketh repentance. And that same man that was wrong got turned over and he said, you know, I, I don't want this. And he went running back to God. <clears throat> We're reminded that a man can resist God. There are individuals that say, no man can resist God. Well, the fact of the matter is, God can deal with you like He dealt with Pharaoh, right? But Pharaoh hardened his heart. And God said, well, here's something, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And God said, here's something, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then God said, okay, I'm going to show you what heart is, buddy. And he hardened, God hardened his heart. Mm -hmm. Things got worse and worse and worse until his ultimate demise. And it's just tragic that Saul, with his heritage, couldn't look back at Pharaoh and say, you know something, I'm just going to bow. I'm just going to bend. I'm just going to respond to God rejecting me from being king. God, I've really messed up. You exalted me, and I didn't deserve it. You've abased me, and I did deserve it. And so I'm right where I ought to be. So God will just be whatever you want me to be. Turn over His kingdom. Support who it is that God wanted to be king. Remember when Samuel, last week we looked, we looked at Samuel uh, anointing Jesse to be king. And when Samuel anointed Jesse to be king, he made sure not to tell why he was coming to town. Because Saul would have had him killed. Saul, Saul was the source of the troubling spirit. <clears throat> it was his hard heart. Friend, you harden your heart before God, and I'm just telling you, you're, about, you're headed for trouble. Headed for trouble. I believe that many of what we see as mental or psychological issues in individuals are the result of a hard heart. I will not give personal examples this evening, but I know of many individuals who are tormented, but they've got rebellious hearts. And rather than deal with their rebellion, which has its source oftentimes in bitterness and unforgiveness, they harden their hearts. And they're positively tormented. And I cannot imagine being King Saul and having a devil tormenting me and just wanting to play music to make it go away. But they got a good musician, David. He was a mighty man. He was a warrior. He was a proven man by this point. And he was Saul's musician. And we see in the beginning that when David played, the, the evil spirit that troubled Saul uh, would go away. But go to chapter 18 and verse 10. It came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times, and the evil spirit went away. Mm -hmm. Oh, the Bible says there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I'll smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. Now, I do not know, I do not know for certain whether this is two separate occasions or whether it's he grabbed the javelin again as chasing David and tried to kill him twice. Now, David can't even play in the presence of Saul anymore. And it wouldn't do any good even if it could. Why is that? But friend, if you don't bow before God, if you don't respond the right way before God, it won't get better. It'll get worse. 
See, normally what happens is when something's wrong and it's a spiritual matter, it's an oppression matter, it's a devil kind of a matter, we usually try first of all uh, to counsel it away or to medicate it away. You know what happens eventually though? It might work the first time and I think the devil's just playing games. He's just saying, okay, I'll let you think that works. And then he comes back again and it's even more discouraging. You ever tried to defeat an infestation? We're fighting the battle on the bus right now. I hate to tell you guys this, but it's been infested. And we're battling it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bomb it again tonight. But we've been battling an infestation on the bus. And i tell you what, you, the first thing we did, we got bugs and we sprayed. You know, the kind of stuff you spray in your lawn. And we hoped that would work. We saw some bugs on their backs and we were happy about it. But they came back. And they came back with an immunity. <laughs> and they came back with a vengeance. And uh, I would tell you something. If you don't just battle and battle and battle and deal with it, we might as well just go running through the car crusher or something because you just never beat them. You know the devil's worse than a bug. The devil's worse than any bug. And if you try something to weaken him or make him go away, he says, okay, he may have to retreat a little bit. But then he comes back. And it's just like Jesus' illustration of the man that had the devils in his house and he swept his house clean, but he didn't replace it with anything. And so then the Spirit came back and he brought a whole legion with him. And it in the end, it was worse than it was in the beginning. You know, a lot of people want to kind of make their problems go away. Saul thought his problem was, well, I've got this evil spirit. His problem was he had rebellion in his heart. Is that what the Scripture teaches about Saul? Right? And God said, rebellion's as a sin of witchcraft, Saul. Saul said, well, you just honor me now and make everything look like I'm right with God. He was concerned about the external. He wasn't concerned about the internal thing. He's got an evil spirit troubling him, and they said, well, you know, play good music and the evil spirit will depart. And so they played nice music and the evil spirit departed. But there came a time when the music didn't make the spirit depart. By the time Saul died, he was the greatest rebel. His rebellion had not diminished an iota. <clears throat> he was not broken. He was not sorry. He was just bitter and anger, angry and full of rebellion. And it's tragic his demise because Saul was a goodly man. He was a good fella. You know, you look on the countenance of people and we started our series by saying people change for good and people change for evil. And we see Saul just changing for evil. You know, people can change for evil and then change for good. But Saul did. Saul changed for evil and he refused to humble himself before God. And it might be you're struggling with the same. You might be struggling with something bugging you, bothering you, troubling you. You don't have to worry about your soul. You're born again. You know Jesus as your Savior. A devil can't inhabit you, can't live in you. There's a lot of false theology about that. It has to do with just bad doctrine about the Godhead. God's not in competition with the devil. There's no competition between God and the devil. But you get away with from God, and you might be. And you're no competition for the devil. Saul always thought he could win, didn't he? Well, just honor me now in front of the people. Okay, God's rejected from me from being king, but what happens if I kill the next king? Then what? He's playing games. And God doesn't play games. So we see in this instance this evil spirit from God. It's not God's spirit. It's a devil's spirit. <coughs> God will let that happen to you. You say, God, I don't want your presence. I don't want to bow to you. Well, what are you inviting then? What are you saying? 
You reject God, what have you accepted? <coughs> the Gospel of John puts pretty clear just with condemnation, doesn't it? He that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. You reject God, my friend, you're accepting the, God's enemy, the devil. I've, had, I've heard people argue that Saul was an unsaved man and that uh, he went to hell. I just don't believe it's so. I don't think Saul was lost. The Bible never says an evil spirit inhabited Saul. It says it troubled him, tormented him. And he'd lash out and respond to the things that he was hearing or feeling. And act like a crazy man. He indeed was a crazy man, wasn't he? I think that's the source of a lot of mental illness. You just give over instead of bowing before God and begging God for help. I believe oftentimes it's a matter of no God, that's not really a problem, or no God, I don't agree with you. And God says, well, I'm not going to protect you from this then. It's a real problem. Study it out. Search it in the Scriptures. We as believers ought to be aware. Because there's a lot of what's going on with people wonder why some of the things happen. Even with individuals that claim to know Jesus Christ, the violent, evil things that people are capable of doing. You ask why it is. Why is a man like Saul willing to stick a spear through his most trusted servant? Why is that man capable of that? Rebellion in his heart and an evil spirit tormenting him. We as believers just need to keep our heads up, keep our eyes open, be aware of what's going on. Because we don't just wrestle with flesh and blood. It's against principalities, against powers. God doesn't tell us that because like, oh, you know, it's New Testament times, there's no devil anymore. He's, you know, it's, God's, there's no evil that's taking place. No, there's a lot of evil, my friend. We need to be a lot more aware of it than what we are. So Father, please help us to see your attitude toward rebellion and toward individuals that won't respond the right way to you. And what can happen to us when we respond the wrong way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.